Uh, tonight, I'm going to share with you uh, my story, A Less Than Perfect Hero. Um, just as a heads up, the names have been changed just to protect everyone's privacy. I know some of you know everyone I know, so, you know, just out of respect. Um, so we begin, right? Uh, pictures are airbrushed to perfection in Photoshop, the same way stories are woven into simple, emotional narratives. Sometimes professional communicators, such as myself, rely on a picture-perfect hero or heroine to help win a campaign. The stories break your heart or make you smile. But in recent years, I've really come to understand the shortcomings of relying on a hero or a heroine. A few years ago, while on a video assignment for a media firm, I captured the story of Barbara. Barbara was struggling to obtain health care. She was both diabetic and had breast cancer. This was pre-Obamacare, a healthcare corporation, as some of you may recall, could cancel your policy in the middle of the worst illness you might have. So often, those are the stories we found. We found the stories of people who were on their deathbed and their policies were canceled. So it was my company's job to tell the stories of sick people who lost their healthcare coverage as a means to make the case that everyone deserves affordable quality healthcare. On camera, this woman poured out her heart as she spoke of nearly dying because her health insurance company took too long to approve her medical procedure. Then they canceled her insurance. And to save her own life, Barbara had to run herself into debt. The next morning, I returned to my production office and I was beaming. I knew Barbara's story was strong, but when I shared the footage, our lead producer's smile went to a frown. I was told that I had cast less than the perfect heroine. You see, Barbara was missing not one, but two teeth in the front, and she was obese. Given her conditions and the challenges she faced in life, her appearance was understandable. But the hard and fast rule for my company was no more than one tooth missing in the front, <laughs> unless it was central to the story. And while overweight was okay, Obesity was not appealing, again, unless it was central to the story. So in my line of work as both a filmmaker and a professional communicator, most advoc advocacy narratives have not only the perfect story, think heartstrings, you know, you're, you're crying, the, the puppy has nothing else to eat, those kinds of stories, right? That the heroine should speak perfect English unless we're playing to an audience who speaks another language. And the additional criteria, which often went unspoken, right? You want someone not too fat, normal in appearance, you know, the teeth, you want perfect teeth, you want not cross-eyed, all of those things. It sounds, sounds so silly, but these were real rules that we had. And of course, you wanted someone with a clean record, no drugs, no alcohol, and no convictions. You could drink alcohol, just no dr alcohol abuse, just to clarify. Um, this was my first full-time job. I was out on my first unsupervised assignment. And it was also the first moment when I started to question how we communicate the life and struggle of real people in documentaries and in the news. This woman nearly died. And what I was hearing was that this woman's story wasn't worth being told because she was missing two teeth in the front. But I wondered, are people really so superficial that they can't see beyond weight or broken English or any other quirk we might have? Is the public capable of hearing the truth of someone's struggle? I found the answer out a few years later. We were working on a wage campaign, and our polls found that the story of people struggling was the most compelling way to win. So we set out with our heroes and our heroines. We encouraged hardworking people who were struggling to get by, come out, tell your story. One woman in particular, Sarah, she warmed cold hearts with her personal story. Sarah worked two to three jobs at any given time, and she was living paycheck to paycheck to provide for her daughters. She's hardworking, her kids are super cute, uh, she spoke perfect English, and she was white. I hate to say it, but for this campaign, that was actually important, or it felt that way at the time. She was our perfect heroine. Nothing could get in the way of the public being moved by Sarah's story, or so we thought. And so Sarah went on the news, she led rallies, the works. We received complaints from haters shortly thereafter via email, 
phone stating that if this woman wanted to get by, maybe she shouldn't have so many children. We've all heard it. I, I heard the response, we've all heard it, right? And I know what some of you are thinking, well, Crystal, how many kids did she have? The answer, three. But the larger question is, why wasn't her warmth or the honesty of her story enough to overcome the facts of her life? This woman, she was a devoted mother of three, still is a devo devoted mother of three. She's wonderfully articulate, she's bilingual. And when you hear her story, the struggle she goes through taking buses, trying to get back on time to help her kids with their homework, it's beautiful. And guess what? She busts her butt every day, day in and day out, to take care of her three children. Some people in the comment section of a local moderate outlet took it upon themselves to create this echo chamber of hate, this ongoing repetitive judgment of this woman online. Right there. I hated the hate. There were many people with open hearts that appreciated this woman's story, but the dominant narrative shut this woman out. The dominant narrative is that story we all tell ourselves. It's, it's sort of the, ex the shared perception of what's happening in our community. And the story here was that the woman had to have less than two kids to be considered worthy of sharing her story. This woman was embarrassed. She never wanted to share her story ever again, and so she st st stepped back from the campaign. And we as professionals, we began looking for other stories to tell. I didn't quite know what I was feeling at the time, but now I realized I was angry because the public lacked empathy for Sarah's journey. We all need opportunities to learn empathy, and at this moment, I was reminded of a time I had a chance to learn empathy. When I was a kid, my mom, who's right there, she's the lady who, uh, who's living the, 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 the current narrative life, that's my mom. Um, and my grandma's there, happy Mother's Day to both of you and to all the moms here. You know, my mom, uh, when I was younger, she wanted me to understand people who were different from me, so she used to take me to the soup kitchen. Um, and so when I went off to college, I wanted to continue doing that. And so there was a soup kitchen down the street from my university. Um, and now in order to volunteer there, you were required the first time you went, you had to sit and eat with the people you would serve in future sessions. And like any good person who wants to volunteer, you know, sometimes we're a bit full of ourselves, I was there to save the day. I was going to help make sure everybody had their food. I was going to be awesome, right? Um, so I met well, but the head of the kitchen was very clear. He wanted each one of us to sit down and engage the folks there to realize they're no different than I am. So if I wanted to help, I had to sit and eat. So I get my food, I go, I you know, try to find the table with the least amount of people. Um, and I sit across from this gentleman, Jim, older, white man, kind of scraggly, uh, and his child. Um, and I just had a conversation with him. It was really, really mundane. Talked about you know, what his kid's like in school, uh, you know, uh, the, the park down the street, how nice it is that the mayor had built it, those kinds of things. Um, but in that moment, I could see that Jim actually was no different than me, right? He had come across some difficult times and needed some help, um, and he wanted food in his belly for him and his son. I can tell you, I don't remember most of the details of my interaction with Jim, but in that moment, I felt very connected with him. Now when I interact with anyone who's different than me, I carry Jim in my mind and in my heart. And thanks to Jim, my internal dialogue has changed. I know the conversations many of us have had in our heads, I have them too. Uh, you know, he probably spends his money on alcohol, or she's made bad choices, or she should keep her legs closed, all those things, right? And I realize in those moments, it's really dehumanizing. And part of the remedy is that empathy. Empathy, at the very least, opens us to the challenges of what other people face. It allows us a glimpse of their feelings, so hopefully we can be better friends and neighbors. And thanks to Jim, I went from judging folks to justifying their value. I would say, well, maybe that person did come across a difficult time. And I will say now, just in the last year, my dialogue is evolving again. Why do I need to justify anyone's circumstances when the reality is that the person has the right to exist, 
They have the right to thrive, right? That's, that's dignity. So going back to the wage campaign I mentioned earlier, as we kept receiving additional complaints or noticed an asshole comment on the blog stating that a worker's too fat or missing too many teeth, has too many kids, she wears fake nails, how can she afford fake nails if she's, she can't pay her bills, you know? Um, all of these things, right? Um, I fell back into the casting machine that produces these perfectly polished co content media that's easily digestible. Even when it wasn't required of me, I would automatically edit who could and could not do interviews. I had given up on the public. I no longer believed that the public could have empathy for people who seem so different from them. So why give them a chance to reject anyone? And this is why I continued to perpetuate the perfect hero narrative. I do not want the stories of people I've come to care about, I don't want their lives to be rejected. But what does that say about me as a professional communicator? Does the end, which is winning the campaign, really justify the means of reducing people to digestible bites of perfection? If so, that means we can only tell the stories of the most socially acceptable people to win our campaigns. But long term, it means people like Barbara missing her teeth, and Jim, you know, hungry, and Sarah, with three kids, get left out. Working moms, people of color, the non-neurotypical, um, they all get excluded from these stories. Who is worthy of having their story told translate directly to who deserves to thrive in our society? And so I have to ask myself, do I really believe that a mom should be unable to share her story in a public forum because she's perceived as to this or to that? If someone is struggling or hungry and their story can challenge the perceptions of poverty or advance a value of a living wage, why not tell their story? At present, the dominant narrative on economic justice issues is shifting to one that's more inclusive. We are coming from a place where we tell ourselves that only innocent people or people like us deserve dis dignity and respect. Anyone outside of that, they can fend for themselves. That's what we've been saying. And the implications of that narrative are incredibly harmful and life-threatening for real people. That narrative feeds the notion that any undocumented adult seeking health care may not be worth it. That old narrative says that if a black kid was thought to have stolen something, the police have the right to shoot him on sight and kill him on sight. These are not narrative values that we should want to share. These are not narrative values that I want to share. This dominant narrative has overridden our ability to empathize with those who are different. And when I think about storytelling in that kind of world, those are the moments where I've wanted to give up, I've wanted to quit. But in the last couple of years, I've had a chance to work on a campaign that's given me hope. That it's given me hope that there's a narrative on the horizon of empathy. It is by far the most honest campaign I've had a chance to work on. And in this campaign, working people have come forth and declared their truth, they've shared their story, and they've been absolutely uncompromising. You may have seen them when you're driving down the street and they block traffic. Um, their persistence and their disruption of business as usual caught the attention of the public eye. And yes, as always, people were judgy. But instead of shrinking to the demands, their belief that they would win and their willingness to put everything on the line has grown the movement for wages and union rights and human respect. Some of the working people in this movement are perfect heroes and heroines, trust me. We've got those veterans who sacrificed, they came back, and they just won a good wage. But a lot of the folks we work with, they don't fit that criteria I was given so long ago. But it doesn't matter. They're proud, they come out, and they share their stories, and they tell it over and over and over again. And that is how the imperfect hero has become the hero. Now the people who judge and stand against these hardworking folks are seen as out of touch. Now I don't have to find that white worker or that business owner to validate the struggle of these people in the, perf in the public eye. More people of color, more women, more 
more kids who, who can't make ends meet, more poor people, and those who still do speak broken English or don't even speak English, they're included in interviews, they're included in the media. With each interview, with each testimony, with each rally, these brave folks have opened up the space for others to come forward and share their stories. So again, that is how the less than perfect heroine has become the perfect heroine. They persisted in their stories, they refused to hide who they are, and as a result, I stand with them. I'm no longer afraid to say, you know what, it's not a perfect story, but it's damn good, and they have the right to speak up. So from all of this, what I've learned is the imperfect hero is really who we need. Thank you. All right, that's Crystal Page.